my suggestion to people <laughs> who are considering they who have this whole like all or nothing thing, either I've got all of Jesus or I don't, then, then I just let him go. Have you tried heresy? If you just try, just try being a heretic. 45 minutes. Okay. What's going on, family? My name is Joseph Solomon. This is The Shores. I'm a former Christian just here exploring the exit out of, of Christianity and what that looks like and trying to help others navigate through that as well. And this is also a bit cathartic for me, just documenting the journey through this. And one thing I've noticed since I've started this channel was that I have not really spoken at any length about a particular key figure in this whole ordeal. I've made videos discussing my exit from Christianity, um, church culture, things like that, uh, faith, philosophy, science, whatever. I haven't spoken directly about the man in the center of all this conundrum, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And I've gotten this question quite often. I've gotten two questions quite often in my in my comment section, not together, but I'll try to put them together. One is, well, what do you think about Jesus now? And then the other one is, would you ever come back to Jesus? Would you ever come back to Christianity? And I'd like to explore that in this video. I've been doing some reading. Ironically, a friend of mine suggested a book about the resurrection. I just did a video on this channel about the resurrection on Easter. You can go check it out. Um, the absurdity of faith is what I was talking about, and I still stand very firmly next to that stand uh, to that idea. And I, I, I think I'm on the right track, at least for me, when I see that I have Christians and non-Christians in the comment section being like, "Wait, bro, what you what you talking about?" Uh, because it may seem like on one side I'm jabbing at faith, but also you can see that I'm, I'm, I'm propping faith up as well. I, I'm, I'm interested. I am interested in belief beyond the rational world, belief in the supernatural. I, I, would, even, I would even go beyond to say that I'm not just interested, but I'm, I'm uh, desiring of it in a lot of ways, you know? But I also know, as I said in that video, that where I'm at now and the journey that I was on as a Christian trying to make rational arguments for what I believe and trying to rationally put things together. And I understand now how extremely difficult, dare I say, impossible to do. I will say that it is impossible I think that a lot of Christians, particularly Christian apologi uh, apologists, will try to, as Kierkegaard says, sell faith at a bargain price as if it is some deeper version of rationality or uh, uh, the logical conclusion of rationality when it is not. That faith is something, is a substance totally other than rationality and no rational argument will get you to the space of a faith. I think one popular and correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, one rational argument I've 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 put some thought to recently as I'm kind of going back through some of the most common objections to Christianity was something that I thought of like hmm, I never thought of the presuppositions behind that, you know, the fine tuning argument that Christians may make that the earth that the universe is so finely tuned for life that there must be a God, because if, if anything was just just off just by a little bit, life would not be able to, ex to exist here. This universe seems very, very finely tuned for life. There's order in the world, and that points to a creator. On one side, I, I would say, I think it's a pre it's a it's a unfounded presupposition to think that that order has to exist because of someone who gave it order and that it's not just simply something that we discover. Also that the world may not be as ordered as we have presumed before, i.e. quantum 
physics. But the other presupposition that I've I've kind of wrestled with recently in the past few days is the idea that that somehow laws need to make sense, that the world needs to be ordered in order for God to exist. Or should I say, why can't God create a universe that has no rational explanation for it. We just exist. I mean, if he made the laws, he can also make laws that don't make sense, that are not, are incomprehensible to the natural mind. I mean, isn't that the supernatural world in general? That it, it doesn't, it clearly can't be ordered. If there is a supernatural realm, it can't be ordered in the same way that the natural realm is. And so the supernatural realm is not required to make sense to the natural mind. I don't believe that it has to. Is it con would it be convenient? Sure, yeah, you can argue that it's convenient, it's useful, but it's not necessary. God can make whatever type of world. If, if God is all powerful and he's the one who does all the creating, he could cr create any any type of world he'd like to create. Um this is a thought that I've been having that I I you know, I haven't tested it against anything else. I would love to hear Thoughts on that is something that just recently kind of came to mind, a question that has come to my mind. But in any case, this book, Dale C. Allison Jr. wrote called The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Polemics and History. And I've not finished this book, by the way, I'm only a, a few chapters in. But what I love about. Dale, I've been kind of gone down a rabbit hole of him. Um, he's a a pretty pretty dope scholar, man. A New Testament scholar that um, I have not I had not heard much about in my Christian days. I really wish that I I would have. Um, he is a he's a Christian, but not an apologist. Even though the title of this says apologetics, it says apologetics in the title because he's addressing apologetics and. Basically, he says, yo, here are all the arguments. I'm approaching this as an historian, not as an apologist. I put my cards on the table. Yes, I am a Christian, but I also believe that based on what we know around the history of the resurrection claims, around the life of Jesus and what happened after his death, you could make arguments that the resurrection happened. You can also make arguments that it didn't happen and you'd be okay in either camp. Uh, history will not walk you across the finish line. Hist historical criticism, criticism is, is quite limited in what we can conclude about uh, the resurrection as well as things about Jesus. I'm getting to Jesus specifically as well. Um, but even what we can know about Jesus, I love what he says in the first chapter of this book, actually, I'll read it for you. Um, he says, authors of books on Jesus resurrection often set for themselves one of two tasks. Either they seek to establish with some assurance or even beyond a reasonable doubt that God raised Jesus from the dead or they seek to establish with some assurance or beyond reasonable doubt that God did no such thing. The arguments of the former serve to defend deeply held religious convictions. The arguments of the latter aim to dismantle a faith the writers reject or perhaps even loathe. The present volume, which is an exercise in the limits of historical criticism, has a less assertive, more humble agenda. This is not because I am, in my religious sympathies, equidistant from the two entrenched camps. After all, I believe that the disciples did see Jesus and he saw them. And next Easter, you will find me in church. But rather, I am persuaded that neither side can do what it claims to have done. This is what I've been saying. This is, I feel confirmation bias that a, that a scholar like him is saying what I was already kind of saying. If you've done any deep diving in the arguments, whether it be online, watching debates and reading books, if you've read any real serious literature around the the resurrection then you know it's not a, a black and white thing 
it's, it's not that easy. And it's not to say that you can't believe that the resurrection happened uh, or that you can't make any arguments for it, but that it won't walk you across the finish line. And that's kind of his push. I haven't finished this yet. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to finishing this through. Now, if you're familiar with Mike Lacona, he's a popular Christian apologist out there. And he even says, uh, I've seen a video of him on YouTube saying that, man, um, you think my scholarship is is something my scholarship pales in comparison to Dale Allison Jr. And he even gives a letter of recommendation, a word of recommendation on the back of his book. He says, this book is the product of the deep and wide reflections of a preeminent scholar. Dale Allison is refreshingly transparent and honest. Some will accuse him of being too pessimistic. Others will charge him with not being skeptical enough. My kind of guy. If he is guilty of either, he cannot be faulted for accepting easy answers or neglecting any arguments. Although I remain persuaded that historical inquiry can yield greater confidence pertaining to what happened to Jesus after his death than Allison allows, this volume is a fair-minded assessment of the data and is scholarship at the highest level. Mike Lacona, Houston Baptist University. So... Um, with that being said, um, as I'm considering, I've been doing a lot of thinking around Christian faith. And with that, you kind of have to, at some point, you can't just deal with the, the philosophical arguments, historical arguments, and the, the uh, scientific things around, whatever. At some point, you have to deal with the guy in the middle of the whole thing, who is Jesus. And what do I think about him now? Well, one, I do believe Jesus existed. I believe that there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth uh, who actually existed. I, I pay no mind to people who claim that he is entirely a myth and made out of Thin air. I don't believe that's true. I, I believe there he is historically. Uh, he is an historical person. Um, he got himself killed, leading a cult or revolution or insurrection of sorts, um, a Jewish one at that, and was killed by the Roman government. And his followers were led to believe that he was no longer dead shortly after he was crucified. Whether or not he was put in a tomb, I don't know. Whether or not he raised out of that tomb, I don't know. How he would have done it if he did, I don't know. Um, what were the exact teachings of Jesus, I don't know. What can we know based on particularly the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? What can we know of any certainty about what he did and what he said? I don't know. There's a lot of I don't know. We can say a lot about what his followers subsequently did in the following years and centuries, decades and centuries later, and even now, but of the specific person, Jesus, I don't know. And if I were to ever come back to Jesus, I've always said since, since, I, since early days of me being apostate, I've always said that I... If I ever came back, it would look drastically different. I, I doubt, I've doubted that I would ever give Christianity, Jesus, another chance. I've done that before. I've walked away and came back before. Um, but I doubt that it would happen. But if it did, it would look drastically different. Drastically different. I cannot unknow or unexperience the things that I've experienced in this life. I cannot unread all the literature that I've I've read. I cannot unremember how much cognitive dissonance it took in my quest to find some 
rational, historical, reasonable faith. It was extremely, extremely difficult. And so I would have to let go of, of a lot of things. Speaking of Dale and speaking of Jesus, one book that I did just finish that I wanted to read before I read The Resurrection um, is uh, this book by Dale Allison as well called The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus. And this thing is phenomenal. I think it's, it's one of the best books I've read on Jesus. Period. I wish that I read it a long time ago, actually, like as a Christian, um, instead of uh, <laughs> instead of ending up like going from mainstream or even some version of conservative Christianity all the way to like flat out leaving full on apostate. Uh, maybe I, maybe I would have still left, but the, the, the exit would have been a little more gradual. I was telling my friend the other day, I said, you know, what? maybe I would have just. One thing I never tried is just being a heretic. Did you ever try? Did you ever just try some heresy? Did you ever talk about that? You know, if you can't get down with the historical orthodox claims of Christianity, uh, before you, if my 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 suggestion to people <laughs> who are considered the, who have this whole like all or nothing thing, either I've got all of Jesus or I don't, then then I just let them go. Have you tried heresy? If <laughs> you just try. Just try being a heretic. Just believe some really unorthodox things. And I don't mean like heretic like the, you know, the prosperity gospel uh, peddlers who manipulate people and uh, who trick people into uh, becoming followers of the church so they can get money and all that. No, no, no. I'm just talking about just, just honest, <laughs> just really honest, kind-hearted, genuine, tender, loving Heresy, just just a little, just a little heresy. <laughs> you don't have to leave the whole thing altogether. Um, and not to say that uh, Dale is a heretic, though some people would consider him extremely liberal. I mean, Dale Allison Jr. is uh, ordained in the PCUSA. And if you're familiar with PCUSA, they're the liberal kind, the Presbyterian Church of the USA. I remember belonging to a Presbyterian church as a Christian, and they were always, I was part of an EPC church, Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And then the other conservative uh, Presbyterian church was the PCA. And both of them would be like, hey, well, we don't, the Presbyterian, the PCUSA, though, they're not, they're not really like, they're not Presbyterian, Presbyterian. It's just a word for them. It's not really Presbyterian. I still don't know the history of the PCUSA. I just know that they ordain women and are gay affirming. So there's that. So pretty liberal. Um, and Dale is someone who believes in Jesus and um, believes that Jesus rose from the grave and yet is by no means a biblical, but someone who holds the biblical inerrancy or infallibility that there is much wrong, much to be desired from the biblical text, that there's a lot of things that we just don't know. There's some things that that some of the biblical authors got wrong. And I'm like, man, I just, well, yeah, I would have loved to consider this before because, you know, this is something I've considered in some sense for Genesis 1 and 2. And why can't I approach Jesus this way? And I'll get more into that in just a second as I kind of talk more about Jesus, but also talk about this book, which has been really phenomenal. I think I want to read through it again. I remember as a Christian letting go of this quote unquote orthodox, and I say quote unquote orthodox because even that, like this, this idea that there's some fundamentals of the faith, there's people who, who peddle this idea as if it's some sort of objective, you know, to be creedal, as it, it's essentially what they mean is like to hold to some sort of confessional or to, you know, affirm the Apostles' Creed uh, or a Nicene Creed or whatever. As if these are the fundamental things. This is what makes you a Christian. But there's nothing really, uh, there's no list in the Bible that does it. These are, these are all post-Christian things. These are Christians thinking together long after, after Jesus. Um, we don't really, we don't really have that. I think it's so subjective for someone to say, oh, this is what creates. I, I, I get that labels are necessary and that you, you have to create, words have to mean something. Christian has to mean something. 
so I, I'm get, I'm with that, but I'm also only I, maybe I'm finding some more stuff in the middle between those things where that, you know, it, where do we get that from? If it's not directly from the Bible, it's from inferences, and everyone has their own sort of list of. And my list was always evolving. I see other people's lists evolving. What does it mean to truly believe in? In Jesus, to be a, a follower of Jesus, does it mean believing in inerrancy of Scripture? Does it mean believing in infallibility of Scripture? Believing in a literal resurrection? To believe it in the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the general lowercase c Catholic Church? Does it mean um, does it mean belonging to a particular church at any given time? Does it does it mean um, believing in original sin? Believe in, in a second coming and what does that look like? What do you believe about the second coming? And Yeah, like I said, if I ever came back to Christianity, I, I probably wouldn't have a lot of mainstream friends. <laughs> but I, I remember believing this about Genesis 1, uh, coming to grips with the idea that Genesis 1 and 2 are not literal. They're, they're literally false. But for something to be literally false does not mean that they have to be figuratively or theologically false. That the gist of Genesis 1 and 2, or at least some of the gist of Genesis 1 and 2, could be that God created. How that happened, we don't know. Was it literal six days? Has it been? Has the universe been around for billions of years or have it been around for thousands of years? Uh, oh, by the way, a great, I think a genius attempt at it. I don't know if I necessarily agree with it. I don't know what I'll think about it now, but one interesting book that I read, uh, I always talk about it, is uh, The Science of God by Gerald Schroeder. And he's a Jewish astrophysicist who um, tries to synthesize, you know, literal six-day creation with the idea that the universe is, in fact, billions of years old. And he throws in some general relativity in there. If you've ever watched Interstellar, that, you know, think Interstellar. Time moves differently throughout the universe. So that's kind of his, his angle. But in any case... What does that have to do with Jesus? What does that have to do with original sin? What does that have to do with me going to heaven and believing that I've been saved? Um, it may get a little more murky when you start talking about billions of years. And does that mean that I think the sort of adjacent discussion around that is, is there a literal Adam and Eve? Because if uh, we need to have a literal Adam and Eve because of a literal Jesus, because there is literally sin, uh, and because there is uh, a literal, this is my reform talk coming out, at least this is what I, how I was taught, is that there's a federal head uh, of the covenant. You can either be in the covenant of Adam or under the covenant of Jesus. And so if there's no literal Adam, then we're left without any real juxtaposition of which covenant you are under. Either you're under the covenant of man or under the covenant of the son of man. But in any case, I still hold to this idea. And Christians know how to do this as well, know how to read literature for what they are, even conservative Christians, that there can be something that is more poetic and doesn't, doesn't need to be taken literally. How far are you willing to go with that? And I believe that that approach is something that I've never really considered coming to specifically the historical Jesus. And so in, in Dale's book, uh, he presents this idea that, well, one, we can't know exactly what Jesus said. These are all memories. I mean, for, for one, we have a translation issue. And I'm not talking about, you know, King James issue, you know, translations or or governmental entities that are messing with the translations. And we can't really get back to we have thousands and thousands of copies of Greek manuscripts. One of the most popular arguments within the apologetics world is that the Bible is the most attested, most uh uh, most attested document that we have from ancient history. If we can't trust the Bible, we can't trust anything in the ancient history, yada, 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 yada. It's greatly attested. Fine, sure. I'm not talking about that, though. That's an issue in and of itself. The issue that we have with translation right off the bat, we're trying to figure out exactly what Jesus said, is that Jesus didn't speak Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic. So right off the bat, we have a translation issue. If I am an English speaker and I want to speak to a Spanish person, a Spanish speaking person, but I don't speak Spanish, I have to have an interpreter. And that's why they're called an interpreter. They have to take what I said 
and then figure out what about that is necessary or what about what he said can comport, can transport, uh, can transport over to the Spanish language in a way that makes sense to the, to the Spanish speaker. So there has to be a bit of translation happening there. And so off top, there is subjective interpretation. Even if you knew exactly what Jesus said, you can't get around the fact that there's a translation issue. So there's that. But then also, um, these gospels were written decades after um, Jesus' death. So a lot of this is memory. These are oral traditions that were going around for decades, John being the last gospel of all of them. And you also have the biblical evan the evangelists, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We don't know who necessarily wrote these. Um, but they're borrowing from each other and they're not just borrowing from each other. They're also borrowing from some other Q document. And again, you can believe all these things and still believe in inerrancy. I just think that it's not as cut and dry as you may think to get to to Jesus. I remember wrestling with that in my gospel class at Reformed Theological Seminary and they were just like, yeah, like this is written. Like everybody understood this is Mark's gospel, even though Mark didn't actually write it. That's the way they kind of get around that. We know Mark didn't write it, but Mark approved it. It was his story. He couldn't write it. I mean, he's a fisherman after all. Most people, most people in the ancient world could not read or write, let alone regular old fishermen. So it was kind of known as their argument would be like, it's kind of known within church history that this is written with Mark's authority and this is his story. Again, you there are a lot of layers. This is just a few of the layers that we have to get through to get to what Jesus actually said and what he actually did. But that's not to say that we can't know anything about Jesus. Don't hear me saying that. And I don't hear Dale saying that. I think his point is that we can get impressions from these historical memories, even if these historical memories are embellished. Just because something is embellished doesn't mean there's no truth to it at all. Just because something is misremembered um, if something may uh, may have been added on or left out or or they just got the facts wrong, some of the details wrong. It's not to say that it didn't happen at all. And it may even be fair to say that it's unfair to put that type of pressure on anyone to somehow have like these exact, no one would be able to exactly remember exactly everything that happened in, in very human sense. We somehow think that this, you know, God oversaw the Bible and that he can somehow make this work specifically for this, uh, particularly for the Bible, that people could remember everything perfectly. I, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of weird arguments out there. Um, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to get around that. The reality is um, we're dealing with human memory. Again, not to say that you can't know anything about Jesus. It's just you're dealing with human memory and all the challenges that come with that. And if you're approaching it as an historian or just a, a, a simple, humble historian, not an apologist, you have to account for that. And we can still know something. We can get impressions. These repeated things where we start to see the same themes that run through the Gospels. Um, we can start to think that there maybe there is some things about this that his followers remember about him, even if these memories are not true or they've made it, it's still something that they believe about him. And that belief came from somewhere. Again, believing that Jesus is an historical figure, those beliefs came from somewhere, even if they are wrong beliefs. They were inspired by something. And if we can kind of put together a bit of a mosaic of of who Jesus is. And I think that that book is really interesting because he talks about how like, well, one, we know that Jesus was an apocalyptic preacher. Um, that's very clear. It's common throughout the gospel. Some other things that are common are Jesus re reference to God as father, though we see that in the Old Testament. It's not as spelled out as pronounced as it is with Jesus. See, he really focuses on God is father. And you know, where does he learn that? Where does he get that from? Why does he do that? Um, we know that Jesus was seen as some sort of miracle worker. 
that he was, uh, he saw himself as the bringer of the, of the end times. He was an apocalyptic preacher that time as we know it ends and begins with him. And he is the one to usher that new time in, whether he got the timing of that right or not. There's reason to believe that, yeah, Jesus truly thought that that moment, um, that es eschatological climax would happen uh, in, the, in the lifetime of his disciples. Some try to argue that away. I think, again, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics. I think the reality is um, the apostles thought Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. Paul thought that, and they had to do. They had to figure out what to do. with John thought that, and they had to figure out what to do with that when they started realizing that he's that he's not coming back, uh, or it could possibly not be coming back um, in this lifetime. And Christians to this day are still wrestling with how to make sense of scriptures to, for their own sake. Um, but again, that's not to say that there is not an end time coming. That there is not some consummation that God has planned out um, that may come millions of years from now. I don't know. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is, um, as we can get through these impressions of Jesus, uh, what are some other things that he says that you can know about Jesus? Um, he cared for the poor. He taught about caring for the poor. He taught about, uh, he had this idea that um, there was something to sacrifice for him. It was subjective. It was different for other people. Some people, you know, lay down your life, maybe a physical uh, laying down your life or maybe a financial laying down. But either way, you cannot continue living your life the same way that you were before you understood who he was to you. He also taught that if you put your hope in this natural, physical world, in this particular time, you will be greatly disappointed that there is a world much greater than this one here I have to go through the notes again to, to think through all the other impressions, but I, I really like this idea that gives you something to work with, that you can know something about Jesus and you can do something with him. He's not completely abstract and removed from us, though that you may have to do some work to get to him. And also his followers believe that uh, he was, was God of some sort, they came to believe that, he, that there was some sort of God likeness about him. And it gets spelled out more and more um, as as the the decades and centuries go on. I mean, we don't even get Trinitarian doctrine until centuries after, though a lot of people will try to read that back on to the, the Gospels. And it makes it so very clear that, oh, yeah, the Trinity was always there. But it's not quite certain that Christians at that time understood him that way. And there are people today who will say, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you're not truly a Christian. Well, what do you do with early Christians who had no concept of that? They just knew, man, this dude, according to them, this dude uh, rose from the grave. Uh, he said he's going to forgive my sins. And if he rose from the grave, then I can too. He's the Messiah we've been waiting on and I'm going to put my trust in him. I don't know how much more systematic theology they had beyond that. Um, I could be speaking outside of my expertise, but I'm sure there's other things you can say. I, maybe I'm speaking hyperbolically, but they definitely, the, the point is being that they it definitely ain't as spelled out as it is for us now. Um, Christian theology has definitely evolved. And so I find this, I find one, I find Dale interesting. I'm not going to lie to you. I find Dale interesting. That there's someone who um, is intellectually honest. I've been really exhausted by Christian apologists who, I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't think they're being, I don't think all of them are being malicious or intentionally obtuse. Um, but it always seems like the end goal is extremely obvious with them. And it's always playing this card of like, oh, yo, I'm just trying to follow the facts where they lead and this is where they lead. You know, I'm just honest. I'm a neutral observer. And I just think that this, I think that's bull. 
I think it's bull. I think it dismisses um, how ambiguous the history of Jesus is and how much faith it takes to believe in him. And I love that Dale is okay with that. I said, man, I, I, I understand. And yet I still believe. Not everything has to be reductionist or rational. And um, that gives me that gives me pause um, about another angle at faith and what that could look like when your faith does not need to. So on once, I don't want to try to go towards either camp on one side, I think. People try to wrap up mystery too much. And on the other side, they don't care to deal with mystery at all. And I think both, at least for me, are wrong. I don't want to exist in either one of those camps. There's one side, people who, in order to feel spiritually uh, fulfilled, they really avoid all sort of rational arguments and rational conversations around faith and think that it's, I've even been told like, oh, the reason why you left Christianity is because you were so studied and so you're trying to research and read too much and they want to avoid it. But I think on the other side, I think the other pitfall is that I think that the entire enterprise, the it, all of it, all of it, all of apologetics to varying degrees, are trying to do away with the mystery, with the 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 mist, even the the sort of fog around it, and act like there's not a great amount of faith to have. You know, I, I had somebody comment on my video recently. This girl said, "You know, I used to be an atheist, and now I'm a Christian, and I can answer any and all questions." That's what she said. I'm not exaggerating. She said those literal words. And I was like, wow, the hubris on this person is crazy. Any and all questions? Then you haven't asked enough questions. You haven't done honest inquiry. You haven't, or at least not deep inquiry, because it's it's not cut and dry. I mean, the fact that there is so much volume of work even from just Christians who are arguing for Christianity, shows you that it's nothing is cut and dry. There's still much liter literature to be written. It's None of it's cut and dry. It is quite ambiguous. And any step of faith that you make will be just that. It will be faith. As Kierkegaard says, it, the rational world and the faith world are not, are not the same. You, you must step out of one into the other. Rationality has to let go of your hand. And I think that you can understand that concept and still be intellectually honest. And so I'm not landing anywhere right now. I'm just telling you where I'm musing right now, where I'm where my mind is kind of roaming and, and, and intrigued about. And I'm intrigued about the idea of being intellectually honest about faith while at the same time um, fully enjoying the world of faith um, for me. And I think that if I approached it that way, then it would, I know that it would remove any ability for me to be evangelistic. It would be a, a, a very subjective thing. I am an, I am an ex existentialist through and through. And it would I understand that, you know, you can lay things on the table of someone to consider, but any decision that they make will have, have to be them. There will not be any rational world we both agree on that we could just walk into the world of faith. Everyone has to make that leap individually on their own without anyone holding their hand. So, and with that, with that intellectual honesty, something I've considered, you know, I brought up Abraham and Isaac in my last video. I was really annoyed that Christians were really trying to get around the point that I was making so that they can not deal with the issue at hand. 
I kept saying, man, Abraham has to be, a, he's seen as a person of faith because he cannot be mediated in the, in the rational world. In the rational world, he is considered a criminal. He is a murderer. And they're like, well, no, he's not a murderer because he never actually murdered Isaac. But he was willing to. He was going to do it. He was in fear and trembling because of the fact that he could not rationalize the two things. And so he, he at least as how Kierkegaard will put it, but he was an individual of faith. And he could not be mediated in the rational world. And they just kept saying, well, well, we know how the story ends, though. Okay, fine. That tells us something about the character of God, but it tells us nothing about the experience of Abraham. In the experience of Abraham, he was walking that route to the mountain to put his son on the altar and murder him. And at the last minute, he was given a ram in the bush and he was able to keep his son. He got his son back. He was able to keep his son. Um, but he had to um, he had to go through that trial. And I've never thought of, and this may sound blasphemous to some people, very blasphemous to some people. And this kind of goes in step with what I was saying about heresy. But I, I, I was saying it jokingly, but I, I, I mean this as a serious consideration that I think we've been told that if we scrutinize Jesus too much, that you'll lose Jesus. And so there's not too much scrutiny you can do with Jesus. And I really, it's really refreshing to read someone like Dale who, who scrutinizes Jesus and yet can hold him as God, uh, as someone worthy to be revered and followed and, and even sacrifice their life for, whether in a literal or figurative sense. And, but that comes with, if you're going to be honest, that comes with, at least in the rational world, putting Jesus on the altar and allowing him to be threatened with being cut up. And who knows, you may get him back. You may get your Jesus back. I think people are scared to do any real scrutiny of their faith, and particularly the person at the center of their faith, because they feel like if they put him on the altar, they will never get him back. And they don't want to do that. Or he doesn't deserve to be put on the altar. Um, but maybe there's some sort of Christological comparison as well. I mean, we always know Isaac was the 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 son that was uh, the only son of Abraham that was put on the altar, and so Jesus becomes that as well on the cross. And you may say, "Well, I'm not going to crucify him again. He's already been crucified once." And I may say, "Well, he's already been he's already been physically crucified, and rose in heaven. What's what's more? <laughs> what's one more metaphorical crucifixion or altar or uh, examining?" I love that he says in that book. Um, I think he's biting off, uh, he's not biting off, but referring to, I forget which one, I always mix them up. I don't know if this is Plato, Aristotle, or Socrates. Uh, it says the, the unexamined life is not worth living. And he says, well, the unexamined Christ is not worth having. If you only want to always have a preconceived conclusion about who Jesus is and never want to really follow, uh, then you you may not, you may, may be left with a, later impressions of Jesus, fortified or forged impressions of Jesus that are not really him, and you're not wrestling with him. And he's he may be a lot more human than you may think and still be God. And you may still get him back. One last sort of analogy I'll leave you with is whatever the case may be, how I see faith, particularly a faith that claims to be rooted in historical events, It must be something that is uh, very, it's a, a very humble approach. If you truly find yourself wrestling with God, there's no way you walk out of that fight 
walking upright. That's what I told that girl. I said, Man, girl, if you think you have all the answers, you think it's that cut and dry to have faith in God, uh, then you you haven't you haven't really boxed. Your arms too shot to box with God. I only cause if you do box with God like Jacob did, even if you live to tell the story, even if you get to keep your God in the end of it all, you will walk away with a bruised hip and you will have a limp. You will not be able to strut. And this journey has definitely been humbling for me. And if I were to ever to get faith back, um, it that that walk of faith would would, would have a limp. <laughs> It'd be a very humble limp. <laughs>